G'day, I'm Sean and welcome to the Car Expert Podcast. We're back again. This is our second last episode before Christmas and uh, to bring some joy before Christmas, we're going to talk about VFAX today. We know you love talking about that. We know you love talking about that, don't you, Scott? I do. I, I can think of nothing more joyous than high court cases and nitty gritty sales data. That's Christmas for me. There you go, there you go. Scott's pretty much rattled off what we're going to talk about today. James, you're here as well. What else are we going to talk about today? VFAX. <laughs> VFAX. VFAX. Uh, and we're also going to talk about uh, the new Civic Type R, which Scott has been driving, and he has, uh, has some cool uh, smartphone features that come with it. So we will get into that a little bit later on. Um, but yeah, well, let's just dive right into VFAX, because we know everyone's here to watch that or listen to that. So uh, we're almost at a record, an all-time record, in uh, new car deliveries in Australia. So, so to the end of November, 1,118,236 new cars delivered. That is a, when you think about the population of Australia, that is a massive number of new cars. Yeah, I mean, if there's, I think there's something like 13 or 15 million registered cars in Australia. That's a fair portion of cars being turned Absolutely. over. Absolutely. Uh, we're only about 70,000 cars short of the all-time record, which is 2017, which is, I mean, in a year that's essentially, we've got a recession going on, we're coming out of a, a what was that thing that we had a few years ago? <laughs> COVID, COVID is what you're after there, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, like it can cause memory loss. Yes, it's amazing. It's amazing, these numbers. Um, so uh, we'll dive right in. Uh, top of the pops, as normal, were the Utes. Uh, but Ranger was actually first this month. Yeah, so Ford Ranger and Toyota Hilux, uh, they're kind of the new Commodore and Falcon on the sales charts. They're duking it out for top spot. The Ranger is at the moment a couple of hundred sales behind the Hilux in year to date. If the Ranger can top the Hilux on the sales charts, it'll be the first time Ford has had the best-selling car in Australia since 1995, the year that James and I were born. Wow. I was 94. Sorry, so. I forget you're old. Um, <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> but back then, Ford sold 81,366 Falcons, 12.7% uh, market share, and it was the be second biggest ever year of new car sales in Australia with around 650,000. So you can see how the market's evolved since then. It would be a massive deal for Ford mm. for to sell more Rangers than Toyota does Hiluxes. You've worked in the Ford world before. I have. What levers do you think they're pulling to get over the line? Uh, I don't know whether they're necessarily pulling levers per se. I, you know, we, you can see just how popular that car is. Objectively, we've all reviewed, driven them, reviewed them, has said how good they are. Even just relative to the Hilux, it's a, it's a better better vehicle in in my opinion for most people. And you know, Ford for the longest time has been really proud of the fact that the Range is Australia's most popular four x four. If they can get over the line with Australia's most popular vehicle, period, that's quite a, a big thing. And I guess you know they'll since the finish lines in site and it's it's definitely a possibility i wouldn't be surprised if they're maybe campaigning with thailand factory to mm. get more cars in and you know satisfy the the back orders that they've got because they've got some of the um, variants have really long wait times as well so i think it's just a matter of getting cars to customers i think that's a big thing that we're seeing with the numbers this year is then they haven't actually sold that many cars necessarily but a lot of the delivery like the orders that got placed over the last few years are finally being fulfilled so kia with their massive wait times ford like you said so there's quite a few cars that are now suddenly in stock and actually in, in driveways. Yeah, this is definitely, we're approaching the end of the good times. Um, VFACT is not sales data, it's deliveries data. And they actually recently tightened up on that because there was a period where it was registrations that were being recorded and it was meant to be deliveries and car makers like Holden with the Astra, for example, would register a huge batch of cars and then put them in a warehouse and sell them as dealer demonstrators for one big month on the sales charts. So uh, it's now a slightly different metric, but um, yeah, these deliveries are based on the last two years of demand. All the car makers we've spoken to recently have said that they're getting significant order cancel rates. Sometimes that's down to cost of living, which is hitting everyone with a mortgage or who needs to buy groceries. It's also down to the fact that um, based on what these car makers are seeing, people have ordered multiple cars. So if you're in the market for a RAV4, you might also order a Sportage and a Tucson. Whatever comes You'll first. You'll take the one that comes care. first and cancel the two other orders. But I think Hyundai was saying about 10% of its order holders are cancelling at the moment, and that probably means that next year we're going to see, once this demand's been filled, lower numbers on the VFAX charts and car makers starting to offer deals. Well, obviously we're a new car podcast, but we are seeing that in the used car space as well, where the prices have dropped 20 or 30% from their high a couple of years ago. So I think that trickle-down effect is occurring, and I think that the demand is lessening. What I do find really interesting, and, and uh, just because this is pretty much the last one this year, I'll go into a bit more nerdy detail. 62,000 deliveries in November were SUVs. 
Like, if that doesn't solidify that we're an SUV nation, I don't know what does. That just... But uh, the top-selling SUV was a Tesla Model Y. <laughs> Tesla's domination of the electric car market is not surprising, but it has been one of the, the sort of enduring stories of this year. Last year, the Model 3 was the best-selling electric car in the country. This year, the Model Y has comfortably taken over that mantle. Uh, Tesla's supply out of China is good. The price is good. Every time a new electric SUV arrives, we compare it with the Model Y on price and go, Tesla's still pretty good value. I don't know whether it's going to be as dominant going forward with more options there, but it's doing something right. 100%, you see them everywhere. So it's no surprise that it's doing so well and it's now actually competing with the RAV4 for the most popular SUV title as well. But another thing I found interesting is that the top three vehicles in November are all Utes because the D-Max was third. So mm. we're also a Ute nation, well, yeah, <laughs> Ute and SUV nation. Yeah, and again, the instant asset write-off went away at the end of the last financial year. So it's not like that's uh, potentially a thing. Yeah, you anymore. can't claim nearly as much as you yeah. were able to during the COVID period. So we have seen a decrease in, in Rams and Silverados, the, the deliveries of those. They were where Ram was delivering a thousand a month, they're now down to sort of three or four hundred a month. Yeah, look, the the Ram and Silverado thing and down the track the Toyota Tundra thing as well is going to be really interesting. I think there is still demand for those cars. People have money to spend and they, they will spend it on big utes. But there was a period there where it was a really attractive deal with the instant asset write-off for your tax. It was also the fact that people wanted to tow caravans, they had money because they'd been at home from COVID, they weren't going on international holidays. Two of those factors have been taken away and I think what we'll probably see is what the real demand for those cars as a work vehicle is, because ultimately they're a really good tool for a job, but as a, I suppose, a vanity exercise, they're expensive and they're big and they're thirsty and maybe they're not the practical car that people need to be buying as they start tightening their belts and things keep getting more expensive. So James, aside from the you uh, mentioned that you just had. What really stood out for you in this month's VFAX? Um, probably the fact that the Toyota Prado is still doing 3,000 units a month. <laughs> That's <laughs> remarkable, isn't it? Yeah, the I know that there's long wait times on those, but the fact that there's a new one coming, people are still obviously taking delivery of the, the current model, which is quite old at this point. Mm. And, you know, the Prado is a great car. It, it has a lot of capability. It does a lot of things for a lot of people. But, you know, you think of something like a Ford Everest, which objectively is probably a newer, you know, more technologically advanced vehicle that's probably better suited to the daily lives of a lot of Australian families that live around the capital cities. It's, it's still amazing that vehicles like that and um, the Land Cruiser wagon range still doing, you know, good numbers and a lot of quite rugged big vehicles. You know, we talk a lot about fuel prices, cost of living, and it seems like the, the sales figures for big guzzling SUVs in utes continues to go, go up because even though a lot of these utes are diesel, for example, doesn't mean they're particularly efficient. So, you know, it's always um, interesting to see the, the diversity or lack of diversity in the vehicles that are in the top 10 or even top 20 of our sales charts um, and they just keep chugging on. And what about you, Scott? Any real highlights for you? I'm actually really interested in how these figures compare with used car figures, which came out for the first time this month from the Australian Automotive Dealer Association. There's a lot of acronyms, I realise. Double ADA. Um, it's interesting, Utes SUVs dominate the new car sales charts, but because there are so many passenger cars on the road, the best selling used car in the country last month was a passenger car. And there were more, pass excuse me, sorry, it was a Ford Ranger, but there were more used passenger cars sold than there were used Utes and SUVs. Um, I think people who are buying a new car want big, rugged, that sort of thing, but the used car market shows there is still demand for more efficient traditional passenger cars where looking tough and going off-road isn't so much the focus as getting to work and using as little fuel as possible is. So I do wonder if that'll also be reflected on the new car sales charts next year when we start seeing orders that are placed now roll into people's driveways and maybe there's a, a stronger future for the i30, Corolla, Golf, those sort of cars. I don't want to dive into uh, used cars too much, but just ironically to what you're saying about them, uh, in that report, there was uh, uh, cars that held their value the best. Yes. And the number one car that held its value the best in the last sort of 10 years <laughs> yeah, HSV was the HSV Club, Club Sport. So I think Efficient, yep. affordable, yep. practical transport. Yep, I, I, think, I think that's fantastic. That is, <laughs> if, that is the most Australian thing I think I've ever heard in my life. Uh, well, I think that pretty much wraps us up for VFAX this month. We will have a final full uh, 2023 VFAX wrap coming in January. 
those numbers will come out sort of early Jan second week. Yeah, of Jan, they'll be like that. the third of January, I think. Okay something along those lines. So as soon as they're live, we our next podcast will be about that. Pretty much. So yeah, so make sure you subscribe if you really want to know how we went. I'm pretty sure we're going to set that all-time record. Absolutely. Uh, I'd be staggered if we uh, we sell fewer than, what, 70,000 cars next month. There's 112,000 in November, so chances are pretty Lots solid. Lots of Christmas presents on the way, what? I'm sure. Yes. <laughs> yes. Happy to Christmas tree. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's not tall enough to fit the coupe run. Anyway, no, no, never mind. <laughs> uh, but look, I just want to touch on something we spoke about last week. We talked about the, uh, Scott drove the Land Cruiser 70 series, the updated one with the four-cylinder automatic. Uh, and we made mention about how we were happy the V8 was still sticking around. But about an hour after we recorded that podcast, uh, William Stopford, one of our uh, news team here, wrote a story that sort of contradicts that. So, Scott, do you just want to fill us in on that? Yeah, so we said last week that the V8 has no end date, but we're also not sure how long it's going to live. Uh, there's a new report out of South Africa, which is another market where the Land Cruiser 70 is kind of a legendary vehicle. It's quite similar to ours in that people demand rugged sort of performance. Uh, saying that the V8 could be going away. Um, once the orders have been fulfilled, they're going to instead sell four cylinders. And in South Africa, they sell a six cylinder as well. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me. Again, based on what Toyota's told us, they have no end date, but there's no point in them developing and pouring money into this four cylinder if they expect to sell it alongside the V8 and just sell it in small numbers. The only reason they would justify that investment is if they think it's going to take over and think they're going to make their money back. And that means a lot of four cylinders over a long period of time. So Toyota has not committed to, I think there are things beyond its control, but it's said it wants to fill every V8 order that wants a V8 with a V8, but there will come a point where it's beyond their control and it wouldn't surprise me if they can't sell V8s anymore quite soon. And I think as much as I love that V8 engine, it, it is a really nice engine. It is cast iron. It has next to no emissions technology and no fuel efficiency technology. And I it's think a proper dinosaur. It is very much a dinosaur. It is yeah, the ultimate uh, T-Rex. And I think there's a very, very limited time. It's, mm. It stays are numbered. So... Um, Hopefully it's here for a bit longer. <laughs> I, I'd love to see it stick around. I want to drive one one more time. One one more time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. One for um, the road. Um, but uh, speaking of fuel efficiency, oh, this is a segue. This yep, is a spicy on. one. So I'm going to put my paper down uh, because Scott, uh, this is. I think this is going to open a bit of a can of worms in the comment section. But uh, Mitsubishi recently made its way through yep. the Australian court system. It has from VCAT right up to the High Court, yep. which is. Uh, the highest court in, in Australia, if you're not from Australia, that basically, once that decision is made, that is it. It is the precedent. That yep. is it. I mean, unless you want to go to you know, the UN, maybe, but I don't think even... I don't even know work. that that's binding. No. No. So, uh, basically, uh, fill us in a little bit, because it's kind of complicated, but I think it's important that people know about this. Look, before I do that, if you are in the comments and you disagree, just remember... We're not from the High Court. Yes. You're not angry at us. <laughs> um, so yeah, Mitsubishi, uh, the Triton, there was an owner who, back before 2020, sued them because he couldn't meet the official claimed fuel consumption figures on the sticker on his dashboard. Uh, he took them to VCAT, which is a civil and administrative tribunal in Victoria, where we are, um, essentially saying that this is not reasonable, these should be achievable and the figures aren't, and he won. Um, and from there, Mitsubishi has appealed it through the steps it is able to. It took it to the Supreme Court where it was found that, yep, no, you are still guilty. Um, and then the Court of Appeal above the Supreme Court and then finally the High Court of Australia. And the High Court has found in favour of Mitsubishi, saying that it's not reasonable to, uh, to punish them for not being able to meet the fuel efficiency standard that is on the sticker. Essentially, the reasoning behind it is, and the reason Mitsubishi won was, it's legally required to put the Triton through that fuel efficiency test. It's ADR 8107, I think. Which every vehicle that meets Australian design rules yeah. goes through the same test. So you have to do that test, and you have to have that sticker on the windscreen when it's a new car. So this is, that, by the way, just to be clear, that testing is not done by Mitsubishi. That's done by uh, government or, uh, government organisation. It's a lab test. Basically, and it's... Everyone has to adhere to that. Yeah. So that's not Mitsubishi making the claim, yeah. So what Mitsubishi essentially said was, if we want to legally sell this car in Australia, we have to do this test and put this sticker on the dashboard. It's then not reasonable for you to expect us to have broken the law by having 
fulfilled our legal obligation and done the test, even though it doesn't match real world conditions. So the argument was essentially, you're expecting us to break one law to comply with another. And uh, I think that's a pretty reasonable argument. Throughout the courts of appeal on the way, there were different arguments from judges as to why they'd upheld the original decision. One of them was, well, dealers, if they want to sell that car with the sticker on the dash, need to then test the vehicle to see that it can do that before advertising that it can. Um, the idea of, what, 6,000 Rangers sold last month? The Ford dealer taking that for a test drive before selling every single one of those cars just to make sure it matches the sticker is not particularly practical. Um, and that's ultimately where the High Court landed, that it was just completely unreasonable to expect, on top of this lab test, car makers or dealers to then individually verify every vehicle beyond that given the legal requirement is to do the ADR test. So it seems to me like a common sense decision, even though it is incredibly frustrating when you see a fuel economy claim and the car can't match it. Okay, so I'm gonna open this up to you guys in a moment, um, but I just, a couple of comments I wanna make before, just to give some context. So when they do the ADR testing, it's very controlled. Every car goes the exact same testing procedures. It's in a lab, control fuel, all that sort of stuff. Um, we don't know any of the details of what this guy did and the chances of him meeting exactly those conditions. Just to jump in there, wide. he actually did um, organise a lab test, um, not, I say a lab test, a controlled test of his vehicle, not in a lab but by a third party. And in their testing, it didn't match the ADR claim either. But again, that test wasn't to the same standards mm -hmm. of the ADR. So he did actually try to match, I suppose, what the ADR claim was through another type of test and couldn't do that either because, yeah, the variables are different. So, I, and, and on that, we've got a video on, the, on our channel at the moment where we actually do test uh, a whole number of different parameters on the vehicle from air conditioning, tyre pressures, load in the back. Uh, we, we never meet the exact uh, claim of the car that we're testing, but it is basically the idea is we set a baseline and then we do all these other mm -hmm. tests to see the variable conditions. And I think that's really what the ADR claim is about is like this is a baseline comparative to this car comparative to exactly. this car. Exactly. It's a comparative tool. Yeah. But I want to open up to you guys. Do you think that there is an issue with that ADR testing or do you think there's an issue with the High Court ruling or do you think there's more of a misconception among consumers about what fuel economy they should actually be getting in their cars? Well, I think this opens up a broader discussion of how these things are represented because if you're going to sue Mitsubishi, you have to sue everybody because everybody goes through the same test. Most of the time when we review a car, we rarely ever actually match the claim. And even on the stickers, I'm pretty sure it says fuel use may vary in the real world due to conditions and driving behaviour and things like that. So there's always a proviso there as well. And I think what people need to understand is in, that's, the, that's the reality of it, that this is a lab test and Australia's ADR test is a little bit behind on what Europe does with WLTP, which tries to repl replicate real world conditions. So, you know, the, there's so much there that perhaps people don't understand or aren't educated on. And so, like, it's probably a good thing that he actually went and did the tests and whatever, but then that also perhaps could be specific to that vehicle and is less about the fact it meets the sticker and whether it actually is up to specification as, as per advertising or anything like that. And it's probably less about the ADR thing and more about that specific vehicle and how he was treated by his dealer or Mitsubishi when he went to them with the problem. Because, yeah, a lot of these utes have... He wanted a full refund yeah. was, uh, was what he requested because he thought that you didn't meet what he was sold, basically. Yeah, which is which is probably a fairer argument than trying to be like Mitsubishi lies on the sticker, which is actually a government thing. And then, yeah, so I think the fuel economy thing is really interesting. Some people seem to take the ADR stickers verbatim, which I find really interesting given... You know, you can very, very easily check your trip computer in a modern car to see how much you're actually using. And, you know, when especially the combined figures as well, when we talk hybrids and things like that, people are quick to look at a combined figure but not think about, I actually drive it in city every day, so I should actually focus more on the urban cycle and sometimes you see greater differences there or on the highway cycle, there's greater differences for like diesels, for example. So it's just a very interesting topic and I think it's, it's hard to solve today alone, mm. but I think it opens up a broader discussion, perhaps requires a bit more consumer education around what actually goes into that and what you're representing relative to what you're going to get in the real world. I think the, the best example of how these figures don't work is plug-in hybrids. Um, something like a RAV4 hybrid or even a big diesel Ranger or something, although we won't necessarily meet the claim, you're usually within a set range of it if what you do on your drive is representative of a combined drive. 
With something like a plug-in hybrid, the official fuel economy claim is usually one or 1.2 litres per 100 k, something like that. Um, and if you drive the car with a fully charged battery all the time, you might use zero litres per 100 k's. If you don't charge the battery, we've seen as high as, what, six or seven in your Outlander plug-in well, hybrid? I was about to say that. So I've been running an Outlander plug-in hybrid for a couple of months now. Yeah. And yes, so when I do my usual commute from home to the office and if the battery's fully charged, mm -hmm. uh, on the freeway, it'll use, it'll kick the petrol motor in. But if I come up uh, like one of the urban roads where it's sort of 60, 80 kilometers an hour, mm -hmm. I'm on electric the whole way. Yeah. So it uses zero. Yeah. But when I've done a long drive in it, I went to Adelaide and back in it, where the battery ran out reasonably quickly on the highway mm. and it was chugging down 9 litres 100k. Yeah. So, yeah, it's... I guess you've got to combine it to, to, to get there. I think, though, that, that demonstrates that as a tool, they're kind of not fit for purpose anymore. Um, ultimately, those plug-in hybrids have a really low claim. They then get under tax brackets in Europe and that sort of thing. Um, so and yeah. here now. <laughs> and Well, yeah, and here now. That's very true, yeah. Um, it's a system set up to make life easier for government to put cars into categories. It's not necessarily a system designed with consumers in mind, and I feel like we're getting further away from that. So I really like that the AAA, the Australian Automobile Association, is trying to do real-world testing. We published the first set of those figures recently and saw which cars came closest and furthest from their official claims. I'd love to see more of it from manufacturers as well. I'd be really interested to know with the Hyundai Kona Electric, for example, that Hyundai goes, yep, we completely brimmed the battery, we drove at a set 80 kilometres an hour and it went for 500 kilometres or whatever it was. Not as a claim, but just as a, we've done this testing ourselves and this is what we've found. And I think there's a lot of consumer trust to be gained by sharing that information. I think if they're going to do that, because I recall a certain German manufacturer with a certain diesel engine that yes. was able to manipulate it a few years ago. Mm. But... You know, you could take the Guinness World Records approach where you do that, all the manufacturers can do that, but there is an independent third party there that adjudicates it, that monitors it, and then they can say, this is the thing, this is what we did. And that, that, that would make that, I mean, I that's guess, the intention of ADR testing yeah. at the moment, though. I think it's not so much the need for a third party as it is the need for the test to be more reflective of the real world or for there to be another level on top of that, which is the real world run. Because again, we spend a lot of time on a proving ground, and I, I guarantee if you just did all of your testing on a proving ground, yeah. it would be very different to mm -hmm. the real world. Like, very, very different. So, anyway, look, we'd like to know what you think about it because I think this is, um, yeah, this is a really interesting topic. And uh, I think that we, especially going into more electric cars, more hybrids, I think this is going to change the way that they do this, is going to have to change going Absolutely. forward. So leave a comment and let us know. Now, uh, we are still running out our fuel competition with Ampol. So uh, the deal is you send us an email, podcast at carexpert.com.au. And we want to know your name, phone number, and in 25 words or less, where you would go with $400 worth of free fuel. I mean, uh, there's a lot of places you can go. Fuel is actually down at the moment. Yeah, it's much cheaper than it was uh, even last week when we spoke about this. Yes, so uh, hopefully it stays that way for Christmas. A bit of reprieve for, for everybody. But have you guys thought last week you, you wanted to go golfing last week, you wanted to go to the peninsula? Any other thoughts where you might go, James? Maybe a beach on the other side. <laughs> there we go. Where instead of going to Mornington, I'll go to the so Bellarine. Down, yeah, down, down the peninsula and then on the ferry across the Queenscliff. <laughs> well, yeah, but I can't pay um, for the ferry's fuel, can I? No. I just pay the ticket, so maybe I'll just drive back around the yeah. bay. Airport Marine, maybe, yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe there is something there, but yeah. If James has left the Mornington Peninsula, I might head down there. Oh, OK. Just for a bit of space. Yeah. Given we sit next to each other yeah. at work. He might have cleaned out of the wineries on the way through this. Just get that in <laughs> Not if I'm driving. <laughs> no. Very true. Uh, we've had some really, really good responses so far. But, uh, you, you've still got a couple of days. You've got until Wednesday the 20th to get your entries in. So email us podcastcarexpert.com.au and let us know where you would go with free fuel. And we're going to announce that winner uh, on our Christmas episode, which is coming out on the 24th of December. So get oh, on Christmas... In. Eve. Christmas Eve. Right, okay. Yes, it's our Christmas episode on Christmas Eve. Yes, perfect. Yes, uh, we'll be busy unwrapping presents on Christmas Day. So okay, we'll time to no, do fair episode. enough. Uh, all right, so our last topic for the day. Scott, you got to do something that James and I are very, very jealous about. Yes, uh, the Honda Civic Type R is arguably the best hot hatch money can buy at the moment. Uh, Even though it looks kind of like a sedan from a distance. <laughs> I can live with that. I think it looks fantastic <laughs> compared to the old one, yep. which looked like a Fast and Furious racer. It, yes, yeah, especially that wing on the back. It was full on, wasn't it? <laughs> um, but Honda 
wanted to show off some of the tech in the Civic Type R and it put a whole lot of Civic Type Rs in pit lane at the bend in South Australia and said, best way we can do this is by you guys doing a whole lot of laps and we'll connect your phones up and show you what they call Log R 2.0. He has such a tough job, doesn't he? It's, it's ridiculous. I was just talking about having to sit next to James. <laughs> <laughs> I have no official comments on that. <laughs> so, yeah, so you hit the track uh, to cut a couple of laps, do your best Jensen button around uh, the bend. Exactly. Uh, how so, did it go? So this app is built into the car. It's free for the life of the vehicle. You don't have to pay a subscription. And what essentially it does is give you the sort of data that you would get if you were on a Formula One qualifying lap. So there's G sensors built into the car, there's throttle, brake, steering, gear position sensors, pretty much all the data you could possibly want. And what you do is you choose your track in the car and most of the big tracks around the world are in there. If they aren't built in, you can do a lap and then set your start finish line and it will then automatically map that for you. Is Bathurst in there? I believe so. I would love to go around there at 60 k's an hour and just see yeah. my throttle trace. Yeah, I think yeah, that'd be really interesting. Gentle, very <laughs> gentle. Um, but yeah, you start your session, it will then give you live lap times throughout the lap. So you'll actually be able to see as you cross the line what your time was and whether it was gold, silver or bronze. But when you get out of the car, there's all this data you can see about what you were doing during your session. So it'll give you the raw data, stuff like throttle position, brake, that sort of thing and where you are on the track. It also gives you these five different parameters. There's like tyre loading, G-forces, acceleration, and it gives you this incredibly polite Japanese feedback. So it'll say something like, your tyre circle is small, consider making it bigger, <laughs> and things like that, trying to tell you how to go faster. That, I mean, I don't really know what to say, because I think, personally, as a, as a, a bit of a racing nerd, as that nerd, is the coolest yeah. thing it's awesome. ever. Um, uh, look, I think the Civic is four cylinders short of a proper engine, but uh, other than that, it is, it is really, really cool. But what I'd like to see, and uh, uh, this sort of has just got me thinking about why can't we have that in more cars? Not necessarily like all the track data, but why can't we have apps on, on our cars and all the new cars where we can see you know, what the tyre pressures and temperatures are doing, what the fuel uh, level is like, what the oil level is like. Because if you're packing up to go away, rather than having to go out and open up the bonnet, and I mean, if you've opened the bonnet on a modern car, trying to find the dipstick is very challenging. Normally it's the person Yeah, generally just, the bonnet. <laughs> it's easy to look in the mirror to find the dipstick, yeah. But, it, you know, to be able to just check all that in an app, all those sensors are already in the car. Yeah. What, I mean, what do you guys think? Was, is that something that we could, that, that we should implement going forward? You're our resident connected services yeah. geek. You Am love I? that stuff, so <laughs> I'm going to um, throw to you. Well, it's definitely something that we're seeing more of. A lot of um, the premium brands have been doing it for a long time with, you know, connected services and app-based things. And I think Tesla really made that mainstream and made it an expectation for vehicles to have that sort of stuff available to you, whether it's being able to have Christmas mode and the, everything lights up and you open the doors and they flap like a bird, or actually being able to look at the vehicle's diagnostics and some of the levels on your phone. So um, in well, terms Tesla of- Tesla has a back end you can go into on the screen to actually see some very specific uh, information. I had no about. idea where you were going with that. <laughs> I was like, oh, so yes. hanging it's on there. That yes. <laughs> it's not in the front. No, they, 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 do, they do have a, basically a a mode within the screen where you can actually go in and see a lot of that diagnostic information yeah. that's sort of, I guess, like admin privileges. Yeah, well, you, you know, um, Ford was one of the first mainstream manufacturers with Ford Pass Connect to give you that data so you can get a full rundown of what's going on with the vehicle. You can get like how much range is still left in your tank, whether there's a flat tire, if it's got tire pressure monitoring, and you can also do the other functions like unlock, lock, start the car before you get in there, turn on the air con, things like that. Hyundai and Kia have started rolling out their own versions of that and other brands are committing to bringing these sort of features to market as well. So even though it's not quite as widespread or people may not really know about it as much yet, it's definitely something that's happening and rolling out across more of the market. I guess it'll time will tell, given that kind of technology in terms of having a connected modem built into the car as an expensive component that also requires you know, upkeep or needs a subscription to a data service. So it means that your network has to be up to scratch and Australia for a long time has been a struggle <laughs> place for some brands like Volkswagen's really struggled with it lately and I think they're going to bring it, it in with the new... To, yeah. yeah, with the new ID electric vehicles, they're going to bring it in. But Audi also has had some form of functionality. But yeah, there's so many aspects to it. Um, so I think it's something that will be rolling out more and more, whether it covers the entire market's another thing, but it's definitely something we're seeing more of. It also needs to actually add value. And I think that's the difference between what we're seeing now and what we saw initially with this tech. 
people already have a million subscriptions, a million apps on their phone, a million ways to control things remotely. Unless it's actually adding something to my life, I don't want to add more complication to that. Yeah. Um, I think with electric vehicles in particular, not the track stuff that we're talking about with the Civic Type R, but it's really handy being able to monitor your charging in particular. Our office, we plug into a normal three pin socket to charge and it's a kind of public car park and occasionally someone will come along and just unplug it from the socket because they're funny. I don't mm. know why. But... I can hear them laughing from here. It's a <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like Scott. <laughs> it's weird. <laughs> when I disappear for five minutes and your car tonight isn't charged, you'll know why. Um, but having an app that actually warns you when the car's not charging anymore is incredibly valuable. I think also the more you do play with this tech, the more you realise how it can be helpful. Um, if you park outside and you've got a car that can turn the heating on remotely, on a cold Melbourne morning when you hop out of the shower and get ready to go to work, turning the heating on so you hop into a warm car is really lovely. Um, maybe if you are prone to losing your car in an airport Ooh. car park. Who did that happen to, Scott? Um, well, not me. That wasn't it? me. It wasn't me either. No. Um, I'm waiting for the camera to oh, flash James, up at me now. James, that's right. <laughs> but being able to use GPS built into the car to find it, yeah. incredibly valuable. So. There are lots of these features that didn't exist in early iterations of this that now do that I think make it more worthwhile. And once people start seeing that value and using it, they're going to start demanding it from more car makers. Yeah, and I think it's, it's on the car makers to really educate consumers about their product. Like, I'll use an anecdotal example. Over the weekend, I went to a friend's birthday and I was chatting to a girl who had just bought a brand new Hyundai Kona. And she goes like, oh, I've got this really cool app that shows me all these things and blah, blah, blah. And so she was going through and she's like, look, I can check this. I love this feature where you can, you know, turn the engine on and put the heated seat on before you get out. And, mm -hmm. you know, she seemed, she didn't seem like a particular car buff. And she was sort of telling me how she got to the point of buying that car. And you know, she was just, you know, she's a normal chick that just wanted to buy a new car for herself and she was really interested in it once she understood what it could do. And clearly that was a great job by whoever sold her the car to show her, they connect up her phone, show it how it all worked and all that kind of thing. And I think that's what manufacturers or dealers are just not doing enough of. You know, you see people that are almost tricked into buying electrified vehicles but not understanding that you actually need to charge things or, you know, around these connected services, people don't even know that they have that features, that level of features available to them when they buy the car. So I think it's it's a really big um, piece around educating your consumers about the product because you know I haven't really read my Golf's manual about how to use everything. You just you a lot of that stuff you just use what you know and you keep it moving. And I'm sure for you guys it's the same with whatever cars you mm, own. Whatever you need to use, you sort of figure it out. You might check the manual if you need it, but the full breadth of features available to you, you probably don't even realise. Modern a... cars are so complicated. That's the other thing. I mean, you used to be able to hop in. Like the last car that I bought was a BRZ and it had a doubled in head unit. There was nothing to work out about it. Whereas the BMW i4 I'm driving this week, there are 17 menus, each of which has a sub-menu, each of which does something different. There's six different settings for everything. You could own that car for four years and not come close to working out what it's actually capable of. So with the level of customization in modern cars as well, being able to actually understand that without having to read the manual, which I suppose if you read before bed, it'll put you to sleep, if nothing else, is, uh, is a pretty important part. Well, the whole point of it is convenience, right? And convenience is, is king. So uh, leave a comment. Let us know. What do you think? Would you like to have uh, an app that tells you all the intricate details of your car or do you just like to press the unlock button and drive away? Does your XR8 have an app? Yeah, you can apply the throttle and oh. go. <laughs> That's about all you can do. No, um, it has a coloured screen. It's not touch. <laughs> but it has a six-stack of CD player. So. There you go. That's a feature that I miss. Yeah. Jimmy Barnes, ACDC. Lee Koenigan, that pretty much sums it up. Yeah. There they go. Yeah, two of each and we're good to go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, guys, that pretty much brings us to the end uh, of our second last podcast of the year. I've only got one Christmas one to go. Any final thoughts you want to leave us with before we head into it? Because next week we're not going to be really covering much news. Next week is a bit of a Christmas special. Uh, any final thoughts? I just can't wait to wear a Christmas themed t-shirt next yes. week. I'm going to wear a Santa hat, but I've got a new favourite Instagram account. Okay. I think it's worth following. It's called Over in the Rover. It's a girl who's got a Land Rover Defender from the 80s. Uh, it is called the Blue Tip. And it is her... <laughs> <laughs> just go with me on this. And it is the only fans thing. And it is her journey into discovering how the car works, how to fix stuff. Does it ever work? 
Yeah, well, sometimes. <laughs> okay. Sometimes it does. But what it's a workshop a, content. <laughs> it's a really interesting look at someone who is just like discovering what this car can do and where it can take you and how to maintain it. And she just has so much fun with it. It's awesome. It's definitely worth a follow. Cool. All right. We'll check that out. And remember, our Ampol competition runs until Wednesday. So make sure you get your entries in. Podcast at carexpert.com.au. Where would you go with $400 worth of free fuel? We're going to announce the winner uh, this coming weekend. So make sure you get them in. We've got a bunch of great responses. So we want to make sure that yours are there too. Guys, thank you for joining me this week. One to go. We're nearly there. Dust off the Santa yeah. hats. We're about to go to our Christmas party. So we're going to go and enjoy some fine food and dining and uh, I can't remember what else. We were going to go golfing, but that got cancelled, unfortunately. Yeah, that's so, a next year thing yeah, that's now, a next year but that's thing, not so. really relevant. That's so. all right. <laughs> but anyway, thank you all for joining us this week, and we're going to see you next week. Make sure you bring your Santa hat.